Welcome everyone that's here at the sanctuary and everyone on Zoom. Thank you for coming. Today, in our worship service, everyone is welcome to enjoy lunch together in appreciation for God has done all in us throughout the past year. At 12.30, we will begin our annual meeting in the sanctuary. There will be some openings on some of the committees for 2022, and we need one person for the Prudential, two people for the audit, and one for Christian Ed. If, you, if anybody's interested in maybe being on one of those committees, talk to Pastor Rebecca. On Tuesday, we're going to have the prayer group discussion of the book, When God Whispers Your Name, and that's at 7 o'clock via Zoom, and we're discussing chapters 19, 20, and 21, and Glenna did said something about some like little homework. Um, <laughs> Uh, Thursday, there's some choir practice at the church at 7 p.m. And we want to say happy birthday to Jeremy Crum and Anna Ennis. Jeremy's on Thursday, Anna's on Friday. And we thank Lindy Milet for bringing the flowers for worship. My heart went out to the Widow's Might Award. That's through the retired ministers and missionaries offering that we're uh, suggesting for. There was an anonymous donor in 1981. She was a v Vietnamese woman worshiping with the first Chinese Baptist church in Fresno, California. Having no particular knowledge of what the meaning of the offering was back in 1981, she slipped off her wrist watch and her only possession of value and placed it in the envelope. This act of gratitude reflects the spirit of thankfulness and gratuity that Jesus speaks about in Luke 21, one to four, and that's what the lady gave her two little pennies. <clears throat> and I just wanna say for the retired ministers and missionaries, that following God's call does not come without certain sacrifices. Retired ministers, missionaries, and their widow spouses are often faced with stress and hardship of unexpected expenses. Medical problems, relocating, or the death of a spouse can cause these leaders to find themselves far from the church family that they once supported them. And then I really like the little, um, this retired female pastor said, you sent a check to say thank you for my many years of service. No, thank you. I am grateful to my God for using you as a special vessel in my life. Nobody can do that. You have helped me in many situations and for that I will be forever grateful. And it, it's that retired female pastor. And someday, Rebecca's going to be our retired pastor. So um, to give to the, the ministers who have helped all over the years of their service and now don't do it anymore. So there's envelopes here uh, to assist with that. And now for my word of preparation. This is a little prayer from the Celtic tradition. It's a prayer of awareness. Awake my soul and know the sacred dignity of your being. Awake to it in every little living soul this day. Honor it, defend it in heart and mind and deed. Awake, O oh my soul, and know the sanctity, dignity of your being. Awake, my soul, awake. When our hope is hard to find And our faith is in decline We need a cause Stand behind love. 
We all want the way it feels. Time it comes and time it steals. What remains and what is real? Love. There is love. There is forgiveness. There is love in times of need. When life is cold, there is promise. You will never go without. There is love. There is love. It heals the sick, comforts the weak, breaks the proud. Raises the meek in this life, no guarantees, but there is love. There is love, there is forgiveness, there is love in times of need. When life is cold, there is a promise you will never go without. When we love one another, it's a brighter day. Love is the answer. Love will find a way. When we love one another, it's a brighter day. There is a promise You will never go without There is love There is forgiveness There is love In times of need When life is cold There is a promise You will never go without to worship is from 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 and 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 4 to 8. Please join me if you'll read in the bold lines. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whatever does not love does not know God. For God, God is love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things. Love all things, endures all things. Love never ends.
Could you join in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I was intrigued by the topic of conversation chosen by the Interfaith Council for this year's um, MLK event. It was called Creating a Beloved Community in Our Time. And the quote that was shared for the invitation for the event was um, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. saying, our goal is to create a beloved community and this will require a qualitative change in our souls as well as a quantitative change in our lives. What I heard in the presentation and discussion on Monday night was a clear call to political action and to intentionally seek out friendships with pe people who are different in some way from ourselves. And I think these are good examples of quantitative changes, something that's measurable in our behavior. However, I think it's also important to think about why we're making these changes, what, what's motivating us. The thoughts that stood out to me from Reverend Dr. Arnold Isidore Thomas's address seem to be designed to kind of evoke a bit of a sense of shame over failures to practice equality in the past. And that is part of how we change. I think it was his attempt to motivate us to do a better job of accepting and supporting and celebrating people whom we might consider to be different. I noticed that the participants were quick to offer examples of friendships and family relationships with people who have darker skin tones than themselves as evidence that they are not prejudiced and that they are enlightened enough to do better than others have. But what I didn't hear in the conversation was a whole lot about the soul level change or love, the root of the word beloved. So I'd like to kind of bring that into the conversation and extend it in our time this morning. Um, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. focused on love in something he created called the role of the church in facing the nation's chief moral dilemma. And he wrote it in 1957, so this was before inclusive language was widespread. So when you hear men, it means all people. He wrote, the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. It is this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opposers into friends. The type of love that I stress here is not eros, a sort of aesthetic or romantic love, not philia, a sort of reciprocal love between personal friends, but agape, which is understanding goodwill for all men. It is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. It is the love of God working in the lives of men. This is the love that w may well be the salvation of our civilization. The truth is that we humans cannot really reform ourselves enough to create a beloved community where everyone is valued and treated with love and dignity. Only the love of God can create such a miracle as genuine soul level change that leads to true and lasting reconciliation and redemption. But we do have a part, and that is opening ourselves to be transformed by the love of God. And when we do this, God's spirit comes in and helps us to begin to see people the way God sees them and to love them the way God loves them. In our passage this morning, Paul addresses the Philippians as a part of the beloved community. His heart has been transformed from having a spirit of judgment and even oppression towards others who were different than himself to devoting his life to sharing the love of God with everyone he met. The divide between Jews and Gentiles at this time when he was writing was just as serious and deep as the divide between different people groups based on color of skin or beliefs or politics or cultures today. And yet, Jewish Paul and the Gentile Philippians were one in heart, and he prays for them to grow in love and insight as he has done. We need God's love to permeate our lives 
growing and transforming our understanding and our actions. So with this in mind, let us listen carefully as Linnell reads to us verses 7 through 11 of Philippians chapter 1. It is no wonder I pray with such confidence, since you have a permanent place in my heart. You have remained partners with me in the wonderful grace of God, even though I am here in chains, for standing up for the truth of the gospel. Only God knows how I deeply love you with tender affection of Jesus, the anointed one. I continue to pray for your love to grow and increase beyond measure, bringing you into the rich relationship of spiritual insight in all things. This will enable you to choose the most excellent way of all, becoming pure and without offense until the unveiling of Christ and I will be filled completely with the fruits of righteousness that are found in Jesus, the Anointed One, bringing great praise and glory to God. If you were here with us last week, um, you would know that we were dwelling on the truth that God has begun a work in our hearts, and he will continue that important work until the day that we meet Christ face to face. And it gives us confidence that we're not just in this to try to a big self-improvement project. God is the one who is helping us grow in love and maturity. So this week we're picking up Paul's explanation of how he can pray this way for, for the people in Philippi and for us with joy and peace and not an anxious spirit. Verse 7, he says, It's no wonder I pray with such confidence since you have a permanent place in my heart. Just a few short years before he wrote this, the Philippians were total strangers to Paul, but now he carries them in his heart and he prays for them, knowing that they are in God's heart as well. He's named the source of their enduring connection and partnership. It is the grace of God. Grace is God's goodness, an unearned favor poured out in our lives and all around every one of us. Grace has radically transformed Paul's life from someone who was trying to impress God with his own goodness over and against other people to someone who is just overwhelmed by the goodness of God. The Philippians have tasted the freedom that Paul felt too. They have kind of left and set aside their pride of being Roman citizens, and they're willing to be identified with their brother in Christ, Paul, even though he's right now a prisoner of the Roman Empire. In the Cultural Background Study Bible, I learned that most people at this time, it's an honor-shame society, and they were ashamed to be associated with anyone who was chained up or in the custody of the Roman government. I don't know if you've ever been in the position of one of your friends or close relatives being in prison, and you might have felt the urge not, you know, to kind of distance yourself a little, maybe not bring that up in, in conversation very often so that their trouble and, and shame doesn't cling to you. But the Philippians were not concerned. They were supporting Paul. They were remaining partners in the spreading of the gospel because the love of God served as an unbreakable bond between them. Paul was not ashamed of them and having them in his heart, and they were not ashamed of having Paul in their heart. So think for a moment, who has a permanent place in your heart? What is it that bonds you to the people so that you feel at home when you're with them the same way they feel at home when they're with you? Physical distance can't dislodge them, make them give up that room in your heart. Is it a very small circle? Have you ever asked God to expand your circle so that you see God's grace at work in more and more people? kind of have a mansion inside instead of a tiny little cottage. <laughs> the recognition of God's grace, God's image, God's love poured out in another person 
is the very best bonding material available, kind of like Gorilla Glue. glue. It goes beyond having just a common interest with somebody like, oh, we're both into hunting, or we're both gardeners, or we like to bake bread. And it glues you together to the other person at the soul level. When Matt and I drove to North Carolina to celebrate his 50th birthday with family in the Outer Banks, we realized that the place in Virginia where we were spending the night was close to where we had lived 20 years ago. And it was Sunday morning, so we spontaneously decided to worship at the church we had attended when we lived there. And when we got there, we looked around for familiar faces. Would we recognize them? Were they still there? And we found Robin and Jeff Norton, who had lived in our old neighborhood and worshiped at this church. It was a joyful reunion, and we talked and talked, and we're like, let's go to lunch. <laughs> and we ended up having a two-hour lunch together and sharing about all the things that God had done in our lives in these intervening years. And it didn't matter that we were northerners, and they lived south of the Mason-Dixon line. And it didn't matter that we had chosen different kinds of education for our children. It didn't matter that we hadn't seen each other for two decades. What bonded us together was that we felt at home with each other. And it, and it was the love and grace of God that made that home, that helped us recognize that in each other's lives. It's a joy that energizes us and draws attention to God who makes it possible. In verse 8, Paul says, Only God knows how much I dearly love you with the tender affection of Jesus, the anointed one. Just think about Jesus and how he recognized the grace of God surrounding every person that he met. It didn't matter if the person was a beggar or a leper, a prostitute, a tax collector, a fisherman, a zealot, a Samaritan, a grieving widow. God, through Jesus, saw them all with eyes of compassion, and he recognized each one of them as beloved children of God. He made room in his heart for them. And people who others avoided and tried to distance themselves from because they didn't want to be associated with their dishonor or their hardship, Jesus moved toward them in love, extending whatever he had, the wisdom he had, healing, provision, sometimes sharing a lunch, welcoming them into his heart, his home, his circle of grace. I kind of I feel like the tender affection of Jesus was reflected in a story I read this week in the Daily Bread devotional. Maybe some of you read it too. It was called Love's Greatest Gift. And it was uh, written by James Banks. And it was a, about James's um, son, an encounter he had one day. His name was Jeff. And he was leaving a store when he noticed like a walker that was tipped over and lying on the ground by the corner of the building. And he thought, I hope there's not a person back there who needs help. He didn't just keep walking to his car. He investigated, and he found a man who appeared to be homeless, lying on the ground and not awake. He seemed to be unconscious. So Jeff roused the man, and he asked him if he was all right. And the man answered that he was trying to drink himself to death because he was in despair after his tent got broken in the storm, because that was all he had left. Well, Jeff continued talking to him, and he called our rehab center and found a place for him to go. And while they waited for help to arrive, Jeff went back to his own home and got his camping tent and brought it to the man. And when he gave him the tent, he asked the man, what is your name? And he said, it's Jeffrey with a G. Well, Jeff was stunned that they had the same name. He told his dad, James Banks, that could have been me. Because Jeff was in re recovery from substance abuse. And it was the love and kindness of God that he had received in his heart that led him to reach out to this man and make a heart, his heart a home for a homeless man that day. 
Those who have never experienced God's love truly, the ones who are still all wrapped up and hurting, they might notice someone vulnerable like Jeff on the, on the ground that day, but they might choose to hurt them or exploit them in an effort to feel powerful and make up for what's lacking inside. That's where bullying, acts of prejudice, acts of power that deny the dignity of other people originate. But when we have been touched and transformed by God's love, knowing that we have a home in God's heart and God has a home in ours, we can reach out to others with that love too because God always wants the circle of grace to grow until all people have found their heart's true home in him. Paul picks up his prayer in verse 9. I continue to pray for your love to grow and increase beyond measure, bringing you into the rich revelation of spiritual insight in all things. How many of you are into measuring things? Yeah, some of us. Um, some, some of us measure how much we eat, or how much we weigh, or how many steps we take in a day, or how high our heart rate gets, or how much money we make, or how much money we give, or what our net worth is, how many likes we get on something we post on social media. But this prayer is for our love to grow and increase beyond measure. The Greek word that this phrase is trying to convey means there's such an abundance. There's more than enough. So much that we don't need to measure it. We don't have to keep track of how much there is or how much we're sharing. There's plenty of love to go around. And when we live in the fullness of God's love, we don't ever have to be afraid of it running out. And nor do we have to feel like we're in competition with others for the scarce resource of God's love and favor. Our world works on competitiveness with an eye toward winning. But God's kingdom runs on grace with an eye toward loving. Becoming a more loving person is connected to having spiritual insight into all things. The English Standard Version uses the word discernment where the passion says spiritual insight. I've just embarked on a 10-week reading retreat that focuses on discernment. As we, need, we are reading together a new book, unfortunately I have to read it on my phone. The paper copies come out in March, but it's called The Discerning Life, and it's written by someone I know named Steve Machia. And one of the main ways he describes discernment is practicing a preference for God. It entails us giving up thinking about ourselves and how people think about us, what we look like all the time, and think about God. Instead of drawing attention to myself, I orient myself to drawing attention to God. So for instance, I'm trying to learn if I'm in a conversation with you, I won't be thinking about how you're perceiving me, or if you like me, or if you're noticing that I have a new sweater on today, which I don't. Last week I did. <laughs> Instead I'm thinking, how can I hear your heart? How can I listen for God's heart for you, with you? The first mindset is egocentric, and the second is centered on the spirit. Verses 10 and 11 in our passage say, this will enable you to choose the most excellent way of all, becoming pure and without offense until the unveiling of Christ, and you will be filled completely with the fruits of righteousness that are found in Jesus, the anointed one. So there's an emptying out of pride and fear and selfishness, which are the source of all of our offensive behavior that alienates us from each other. And when those are cleared away, there's room for a filling of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Our interactions with others will be opportunities from the Spirit to discern what does love look like in this situation? 
What is God's will for what happens next? And it takes humility to relinquish the spotlight, to relinquish control of our lives like this, and live centered on the love of God. I was reading in a book, I mentioned it before, it was called Start With Amen, How I Learned to Surrender by Keeping the End in Mind by Beth Guckenberger. And last time, if you were here, you remember me telling you about how Beth and Todd saw the sign in Mexico on a mission trip that God was calling them to work with orphans and vulnerable children in Mexico full time. Well, the story that I read in her book this week um, just kind of spoke to all the things we've been talking about this morning. Beloved community, God's grace, seeing each other with God's love, discerning God's will, surrendering the spotlight, and receiving the beautiful gift that God has for you in each situation. So Beth was spending the day in what she described as a marginalized community of indigenous women in Mexico. They were single parenting. And she had 20 or so women from the US with her. And she was trying to help them see what was really important here. So she told them, don't look at the houses around you, look at their relationships. Don't ask about what they eat, ask about provision. So all these women were coming with the intention to be blessed in their interaction. And the American women this day brought food for a meal. But Beth reminded them that it was equally important to receive what the Mexican women had to offer. She said, we do a disservice when we give and don't take. That might seem counterintuitive, but when we give and we don't receive, we're subtly saying, you don't have anything to offer me, and I get to hold you at arm's length. So the day together ended with a worship service, and at first it went in an organized fashion, the way that the American women were used to worshiping, but then, Best Mexican friends began to sing off script, and they started to dance, and they were singing in response to each other and to the Lord. And Beth could feel caught in between these two groups of people, and she could tell the visitors were feeling uncomfortable, and she needed to discern in this moment, what do I do? She says, do I sing something? Do I dance? Is anyone looking at me? This feels weird. Have you ever been there? She saw one of the women from the US step out of her comfort zone and join in the dancing. And Beth's heart filled, and her legs carried her forward to join. And more women let go of their self-consciousness and entered into the joy of surrender and connection and worshiping the Lord and beloved community. It was clear to them it wasn't about how they looked. It was a shared focus on God's grace and goodness and surrender to God's will that led them to this place of love and hope together. That was their gift. And just as Paul wrote at the end of verse 11, it brought great praise and glory to God. The beloved community is not just Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. It's God's dream, too. God's agape love is at the center of this community of belonging. It is how the Holy Spirit is whispering to you this morning. He's giving you some kind of invitation. Where is the part that you need to surrender to God's love so that you can share it with everyone that you meet? Will you let go of control of the spotlight, of the consuming effort to gaining and trying to maintain significance in this world, and instead embrace God's love for you. God is reaching out to you this morning, and when you come home to God, you will be ready to reach out to them with love. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for loving us with all our quirks and our mistakes and our particularities. There's nothing that you don't know about us, 
and you love us so deeply. Help us, Lord, to receive that love, to know that we are at home in your heart and you can be at home in ours. Please continue to grow the space in our hearts to invite more and more people to reside there, to love them, to pray for them, to receive from their encouragement. Lord, I pray that even our time together this afternoon will be an experience of beloved community, that we would be able to share what we've seen in each other that is your love flowing through us. Not for how great we are or anything like that, Lord, but may all the glory in our conversations go to you because any good thing in us is really from you. We thank you for the food that's been provided. We thank you for all your goodness, and we bless it in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. When our hope is hard to find And our faith is in decline We need a cause to stand behind Love We all want the way it feels Time it comes and time it steals What remains and what is real There is love, there is forgiveness, there is love in times of need. When life is cold, there is a promise, you will never go without. There is love. Comforts the weak, breaks the proud, raises the meek. In this life, no guarantees, but there is love. There is love, there is forgiveness, there is love in times of need. When life is cold, there is a promise. You'll never go without no love is the answer. Love will find a way when we love one another. It's a brighter day. six from the Living Bible says, May God, who gives patience, steadiness, and encouragement, help you to live in complete harmony with each other. 
each with the attitude of Christ toward the other. And then all of us can praise the Lord together with one voice, giving glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.